I am going to teach you how in any medium with any painting, you can bring your paintings alive with light. Now, this is this is new. You said you've held this back for, you've been teaching it for how many years? 20 well, I've years? I've been teaching this for nearly 20 years. Yeah. It's definitely progressed. So the involved. only people, the only people that have seen it are your students. You've never My gone students, public with this. I've worked with. And the only reason you're going public, we'll talk about in a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, let's get the show started. Okay. <laughs> So what I'm going to teach you here and just kind of share is what goes on in my brain to be able to see and paint the illusion of light. So I always think about painting as, you know, really what we're doing is it's just an illusion. So I've just got kind of a basic drawing up here. I've got a still life set up. I'm primarily a landscape painter, but studying color from life and studying from still life is a really great way to do this. So up here, I've just got a drawing done, and I've got my, my basic primaries. So we're gonna talk about primaries, secondaries, and tertiaries. So up here, I've got Y, R, and B, which is yellow, red, and blue. Okay, that's a primary, those are primary colors. Out of the primaries, we can make secondaries. So yellow and red makes orange, red and blue makes purple, and yellow and blue make green. All right, so. I'm just going to breeze over this really quickly. This is going to be a crash course for sure. But in the properties of color, we've got hue, value, temperature, and saturation. So these are things that I'm always thinking about. And mainly what I'm doing when I'm studying anything, landscape, in plein air, studying a still life, whatever it is, I'm looking to see how one color relates to another. So here I've got my drawing. I always get my drawing in first, and then I have a separation between my lights and my darks. So the strategy begins. <laughs> the brain strategy that goes on in my head before I even hit the canvas. So years ago, I realized that it was the tertiaries that were kind of confusing my students. They could see that something was yellow, red, or blue. They could see that something was orange, purple, or green. But when they added the tertiary to gray it or dechromatized or neutralized their color, they got mud. So what I began doing years ago with my students, and it's remarkable what's happened with their work, is I had them beginning with just the secondaries. So when they would look at a color, they would have to decide which of the secondary, if they had to name the hue, was it orange, purple, or green? They could usually do that. They would have to choose though. And then they would have to decide, was it predominantly yellow, red, or blue? So when wait, I looked wait, at wait, my wait. scene- Do that yes. again. You got to explain that again. You lost yeah. me already. Okay. So when they're looking at the scene, let's just say I'm looking up here. I'm going to switch now. I'm going to switch my board so you can see some color. So here oh, you did that this, fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm really quick. Yeah, you are. <laughs> this takes some time. But I wanted to kind of have just, just to kind of show everybody how I strategize this. So again, primaries are yellow, red, and blue. I have found that you can make anything in nature using the primary. Now, the secondaries, most people understand what they are but some don't, yellow and red is orange. So orange is a primary, red and blue is purple. That's Wait, the orange, orange is a secondary, isn't Secondary, it? did I say primary? You did, okay, just okay. checking, just making sure you're paying attention. Just do what I think, not as I say. Uh oh, that's scary. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yellow and red, primaries make a secondary, red and blue, Primaries make a secondary, which is purple, yellow, and blue. Green would be your secondary. So you really only have three primaries and three secondaries. A tertiary would be all three. And I think most painters can agree that everything in nature is pretty much tertiary. But it's the degree of how much, right? The difference. So what we started doing 
years ago with my students is I realized that it definitely was the tertiary when they started integrating the tertiary to gray it that began making their paintings look like mud. Okay. So what I had them do in a class, this is like 18 years ago, as I said, everybody, you're only using yellow, red, and blue and white, and we're going to take away everything else. I want you to know how to make secondaries, and then we'll start integrating gradually the tertiary. So this strategy, it just blew my mind, and I wrote a whole book on it because people's work became alive with light and color. And I realized that what they really needed was to know what was going on in my head, not what it was physically looking like when I was painting. So this is an exercise to teach us how to see the relativity of color. And the relativity of color is how one color compares to another, okay? It's not what it is alone when you stare at it. It's what it is compared to one average. So I would consider this shape an average, this shape an average, and that's how I refer to these. And every single shape that you see here that I have divided between lights and darks would be a color average. So when I'm looking at a scene, as you see here, I get to pick two primaries, all right? I only get two, I don't get to gray it. And that's just the beginning strategy to create the illusion of light. So that's what I'm doing. It's an illusion, okay? It's just paint. So when I'm looking and I'm studying back and forth, I've got a still life set up here. I am gonna ask myself, what is this color compared to this color? And I have to name it. And what, what's tricky about studying color is that we see all the colors and it's confusing. And we also try to name a color that is undefinable. I mean, it's like, it's everything. It's the endless nuances. So that's hard. But to simplify this, to see how one color relates to another color, oh my gosh, it's like it opens up the world for you of being able to paint anything. If you think of everything as just a shape and a color, you can paint anything, water, ice, glass. I mean, the things that people say are hard are not hard if you look at it as a shape of color. So let's just start here. So what I did up here is I got my drawing in. I defined the separation of lights and darks because every time there is a, there is a light, there is a dark. Every time there is a dark, there's a light. And we have to decide where that separation is to help create the illusion of light and form. So in the color, what I'm doing is I'm always scanning the scene and I'm talking about my scene up there. So I usually start with my darks because I think they're the easiest to kind of identify for me. And I started with this dark and I could see, I asked myself, was this color looking up there, was it more orange, was it more green, or was it more purple? Those are the only options I have because I'm looking at secondaries. And I looked at this green bowl and it was pretty easy. I thought it's definitely more green and I'm comparing it to the other things. If everything else was really green up here, maybe this would look purple to me. But compared to the oranges and the lemon, it looks really green to me. So what I did with my pencil, pastel pencil, is I put a B and a Y here because it's predominantly blue. Blue is the darkest and the coolest compared to red and yellow. So the predominant color goes first as far as labeling my strategy. So I put a B and a Y here. Can you see that? Okay. And then I would go to this because that's a shadow. I'm gonna show you there. And I saw that compared to this, it looks more purple than that one. And it looks a little lighter and a little cooler. So I'm looking at the relative value and temperature. All right, so it's definitely cooler than warmer. So blue is cooler than red. So I put the B first, the R second. 
BR. So I'm strategizing in this section. Okay. So you could just in theory, yep. you, you could make that BR seven if you wanted to tie a value to it. Yeah, I could do that. It's probably like a BY six. Um, yeah, okay. yep. But yeah, definitely. If you wanted to do, I use a one to nine point value scale. So for those that are newer to this or that aren't, it's helpful for me too. This would be the division between light and dark when there's, these are darks, these are your lights, okay? So that's always helpful to know that that's what Eric's referring to. So he says it could be a seven. This is about a six. I'd say this is about a seven and a half. All right. So somewhere in there, but of course we're on the screen, so it looks a little different, right? Well, I was referring to the purple shadow anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just so people know, right? Yeah. Yeah, good. So we're looking at value relationship and temperature relationship, okay? Is something lighter or darker? Is it cooler or warmer? And we kind of know as painters, we can never say something is warm or cool because it's got to be relative. So as I strategize and I move on, and this feels really good on the brain. It's just like exercising or conditioning because you're just going, well, I just have two. I, I mean, you've got a pretty good odd that you might, <laughs> you might get it right. In the shadow, typically I find that there's oftentimes blue is first, the predominant. So as I'm strategizing, I'm realizing that if it's in shadow, it's probably bluer than the lights. Not always, but usually. So you can see that I had, I looked at the orange. Oranges are tricky. I always have my students pick them because there's so much heat in the shadows and you think, well, how do I make that? And then they make kind of a muddy, icky brown. But if you look at the relationship of those and I say, I get two, is it more green or is it more purple? And relatively, and then I looked at this shadow, that was purple, that was green. But that's the green that I made. And so I'm just constantly moving my eyes around. Is this kind of making sense? You're confusing the heck out of me, but yes. That's okay. Um, Cause you know, oh so, yeah. So I, I just want to clarify something because that's yeah. my job. Yeah. Uh, when I'm looking at the oranges, when I from from here, I'm not seeing green in the shadow, but you're saying it's one of the three. Uh, and so you got to pick which is it. It's more, it's cooler. Is it cooler? Is it warmer? Is it green? Is it purple or is it orange? It can't be orange, right? So, right. so it, it becomes green. And then is that, I can't tell what, what's written in there. Is that, uh, so green this plus? was BY and this is YR. Okay. So this is green. This is orange. Okay. Blue plus yellow. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I have 200 pages on this and all the different, you know, really breaking this down. Basically, this is going to be somewhat of a teaser. I mean, just to introduce this to you. Of course. And, yeah. There's more depth to it. Yeah. I mean, it really is. I mean, this takes it, you know, I, I do this every day. This is how I strategize and paint and what goes on in my mind for sure. And, and this is how we start our paintings, which is kind of amazing because you actually have a strategy. But again, this is not a 30 minute demo. You know, this is introducing a concept and a strategy. Yeah. And so the whole in depth of that is in your new book. It is. Yeah. And we're putting, we're putting the link to the new book into the, into the comments section. So you guys can get it. The new book yeah. is called color relativity, creating the illusion of light with paint. Yeah. So this is something I'm going to just show you this. This was a demo that I did for my class. This was about a two hour demo um, using two colors. Can you see that okay? Yeah. So using two colors per average. So let me just show you kind of how this, oops, this is like backing a trailer up, Eric. <laughs> Seriously, it's the opposite of what you think. So in here, can you see that through all the nuances, the shadow's green? Yeah. That the shadow's purple, the shadow's green. Yeah. The shadow here is actually orange. Yeah. Um, but see how these are relating. So this kind of makes more sense when people see this, like, and that's the most common thing people ask me is how do you get all your color? And this is how I do it. So, you know, at this stage in my career, 
I'm not really performing when I'm showing a strategy or teaching. I'm, I'm teaching something. I'm teaching you something that you can take with you. So, so this is how I do this. These were two, this began just like this began. So, and then what happens is you get your averages in. So the average, I always tell my students, it's the most that you see when you squint in one shape. So like this is an average, this is an average. And as you get the averages in, then you get to work in the other nuances. You don't just leave the two colors. You use that, I call it a mother pool. So each average that I make, and I'm gonna share with you guys how I make these colors with just two colors plus white. So I'm gonna give you a sample of all this today. All right. But we'll start with that. Wait, I just want to know, does any, anybody in the comments, does your brain hurt? Yes. No. <laughs> yeah, it does sometimes. Um, I love it, though. I mean, it feels good. And like I said, I've, I've taught a lot of students, uh, uh, nearly a thousand now, um, and it's working. So, you know, this is exciting, and it's, it's a way that I can hopefully help people. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to continue on here. And as I'm talking through this, I'll show you how I mix this. All right. I like to, what was that? I said, okay. Okay. <laughs> as I, I kind of started the shadows, I'm going to continue on with the shadows. I am going to share with you that I didn't strategize this color because it's a little bit tricky for me. So I was thinking, okay, but what I'm going to do is relate this one to, this is a cast shadow and this is an upright shadow. That's important to know because it helps to create the illusion of form. This is a cooler shadow than this, and it's darker than this, but I still think it's green. So I'm going to put BY, and I can vary the degrees in the blue and the Y to make these different than one another. This cast shadow I determined was purple compared to these. All right. This upright shadow. I'm actually going to make BY. So I'm going to make that green. So down here, I'm going to show you my palette. People always love to see mixing colors. Seems to be helpful. Uh-oh. Can you see that okay? Yeah, we all lived through it. I know. Good. Thank you. Thank the Lord. Okay, let me see. If that falls, I sure hope it doesn't. So you can use your brush or you can use your palette. And I, I think it's a little faster to mix with the brush. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to make the, um, the, the cast shadow on the lemon. So I'm going to start with blue because that was my predominant. All right. So I'll get a nice amount. A little bit of thinner just so I can move the paint. And then I'm going to mix white to get the value because that's the predominant color. Before... I even bring over my secondary. I've got two yellows, I've got two reds, and I've got one blue. So I can choose between my two yellows to give myself a little bit more variety. So right now what I'm just doing is just checking, I'm just getting my value. This is about half tone, my palette. That's half helpful for me to see that that's darker than half tone. Make a note. Okay, so that's about the right value. So now, you're not necessarily using a, a three color or a limited palette. You're using variations of reds and yellows. And yeah, blue. I've got cad yellow light. That's going to be my warmest yellow. I've we can't, got... we can't actually see your color oh. row. There we go. Da, Perfect. Da, da, da. See, I need to come. I need, I need that. So I've got cad yellow light. So that'll be my warmest. I've got cad yellow has a little bit of red in it. So that's going to be cooler than my cad yellow light. And then I've got cad red, which is cooler than these yellows, warmer than alizarin and ultramarine. And then I have alizarin crimson, which is going to be my cooler out of the two reds, but warmer than ultramarine blue. So alizarin and then ultramarine blue. I used to use cobalt, but I just don't find that I really need it anymore. Well, you just so, created something that looks like it. What? Oh yeah, this looks like ultramarine, or this looks like cobalt. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to pick, I'm going to use um, CAD yellow light. So to the side, I'm going to just desaturate this a little bit before I integrate it in. Okay, so now I'm merging the colors and I mix pretty fast. So we'll get through this. I know that this color needs to be a little bit 
darker and a little bit cooler than my other color that I'm comparing it to. So now I'm going to just show you. This will be tricky moving back and forth. That's all right. Okay. How's that? It works. It's working. So now I'm just going to lay this down here. I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm not performing. I'm just studying color. So I can just leave that in there just like this. Okay. So that's the relationship of those two. All right. So that's a little bit darker, a little bit cooler, but it's still green. All right. So now down on my palette, every single time I go to a new color at this stage, I clean my palette and I start with the new color because I'm painting the relativity, <laughs> the relationships. Okay. How's that? Yep. So every single time I'm going to get rid of this and I do not see it as a waste of paint. You could save this if you wanted. I see it as studying. I think it's more of a waste of paint when you're just guessing and not having a place to go. So to me, this is, this is painting. You can definitely save your paint to the side if you want. Clean my brush in between. I'm gonna go to the next color. I think for the sake of time, I'm gonna start painting the lights before I get the darks, but typically I wouldn't do that. So let's do this, let's do this orange on the, um, on the orange, the light on the orange. Okay, so it's predominantly yellow and you could use either yellow, but I think this will get me a little closer. I'm gonna start with the cad yellow. I'm desaturating it, but not too much because oranges are pretty saturated. That's the intensity of the color before you start dechromatizing it. Well, and white will cool things down quite a bit. Right, and I think it desaturates it too because of the cooling, right? So I'm gonna use cad red. I could use alizarin if I wanted, but I am going to start desaturating it a little bit to the side so that when I put it into the predominant primary, which I decided already is yellow, I can start, con I can control this. So I can watch the color emerge, all right? So, as I'm moving this together, I'm watching the color develop. All right, so now it looks like I got a little dirt in there. I'm going to move you guys up. And okay, I want to say hello to South India. Hello to wow. Netherlands. Hello to Guatemala. That's I've not seen cool. Guatemala on here before. Welcome. Yeah, welcome is right. All right, so can you just see that now I'm just going to mask this in? Yep. It's going to be nice and saturated. But I also see I didn't make enough paint. So nice and bright and warm. Okay. But I really want to get the saturation. That to me is in the temperature and the value. That's all. <laughs> but see that I'm just massing this. I'm just laying it down. And when I paint, I really think about planes, you know, the form of something. So I'm creating somewhat of an illusion. I'm paying attention to the plane changes. People are asking what brand of paint you're using. I assume it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. I, I, do, I do use Gamblin, Rembrandt, and Winsor Newton. Right. So oh, Italy. Italy? Italy. Wow. Let's go. Let's all go. Let's go for real. <laughs> yeah. I would love to go there again. I used to teach there before the pandemic. <laughs> okay, let's make some more color here, you guys. So we're gonna move over to a lemon now. Do you like it? Is it helpful to be watching to see the um, palette? Yeah. People are digging that. All right, so let's do a lemon. Let's do the yellow on the lemon. So I used the cad yellow, which has, like I said, a little bit of red in it for the orange. I'm gonna use um, cad yellow light, which does not have any red in it. And we're going to desaturate it just a titch. It'll give it a little bit more brightness. White also can help reveal a color. So you do want to, you can't really, I think, I think it's tough to paint without, without white, unless you're a watercolorist, but um, what was the next color? Oh yeah. Red. So we're going to use just a little bit of red. But do you see how to the side, I'm mixing it, I'm desaturating it to the side before I bring it in. This way, I can control the outcome of the color and I can see it develop and I, did, I don't waste paint that way. So this is a really nice orangey kind of color lemon. 
So there's definitely some heat in here. So I'm making the yellow and I'm just watching it develop the color. I'm gonna make a note and then I'll show you guys. Oh yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so these are just two colors, but it's not, like I said, it's not like this is how it's gonna stay. This is how I strategize the relativity, okay? So I'm just laying it in here. And you can leave a little bit of space between. It doesn't really matter because it's not, this is just the blocking in to create the illusion of light. Okay, so now right. we've got our block in for that. Might be fun to do the tabletop because that'll be a lot of ground to cover and more paint. So let's try that. The tabletop's always interesting. That kind of throws people off. I like to practice this strategy using a white tabletop so that you have a variety of local hues that you're trying to create. So it's not just white. What's the temperature of the light is what I'm always thinking about. And this is a warm light. So I've got it set up with a warm, kind of a yellowish red color light. So when I'm thinking about this and I'm studying it, I'm realizing that the envelope of light is sprinkling, if you wanna say, little notes or little like a like almost like a piece of acetate everything in light is going to get harmonized by kind of a yellow red color if you want to think of it like that so we're so oh, it'll be like a mother color yeah could be like yep so like that would be the temperature every local color is going to get warmed by the temperature of the light okay so i had decided I only got two because I see everything in there. That's the problem. I see purple, I see green, I see everything, but I have to pick. So these are predominantly yellow. And I know that this is warmer and lighter than all my shadows. So I switched, this is a little bit cooler looking to me. This is than the lights on the fruit. So I started with red. That'll be my predominant and then yellow. All right, so I'm gonna start with a nice amount of white because I'm gonna cover a big area. Okay, hold on. What kind of white are you using? Is it titanium? Yep, it's titanium. I like it because I like, I like the opacity and the coolness. What do you use? I use titanium and, and lead. Yeah, I used and to I, use and, and when I use lead, I lick my fingers. Yeah, <laughs> why not, right? Yeah. I try to use gloves now. So when you're working with white, you do want to have it pretty clean. So I always put my white out in a, what I call a snake. So I can always grab clean. And then I grabbed from the back. I am using alizarin and I'm using cad yellow light. And I'm going to start with the red, which is the alizarin, mix it up real well. That's going to be my predominant. You know, I just want to make sure I have enough color on this tabletop that it's not anemic looking. Um, that's pretty important to me that I have room for the intensity of the color, but it's, excuse me, I have the hiccups, less saturated than the other colors. You've been drinking again? What was that? I said, have you been drinking this morning? Yeah, <laughs> maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> I really do have the hiccups. I'm not breathing. So now I'm starting to merge these and I'm getting a really pretty warmish kind of color. I'm gonna make a note and see what I think. I think I just want it a little bit warmer. So I'm gonna add a little bit. So out of yellow and red, yellow is my warmer note, okay? But I wanna make enough so that when I get up there, I don't run out. That's always frustrating if you don't have enough color. So we'll mix this up really well. And this is, you know, you mentioned mother pool or did you mother color, did you say? I did. Yeah, so I call my average is a mother pool, mother which pool. is kind of interesting. Um, we might all have a little bit different, you know, definition for that because we kind of painters seem to have a language all their own. Um, each average I call a mother pool. And then there's baby pools I call within, which would be different temperatures, like this being the redder and this being the yellower this is going to be my cooler side and this is going to be my warmer side so although this is pretty much the same average there's subtle temperature shifts in here 
Cool. Right now, I'm just going for a flat average. But if I were really doing a painting, not an exercise, I would be, I would be having an array of temperatures in this mother pool. Okay, so this looks really good. I'm gonna show you guys. So this is the temperature that I see, all right? So we're gonna just get this masked in. Similar to like if I were doing a sky, I would just kind of get it going, um, get my average in. I do a lot of, you know, like sky classes and water, how to paint sky, how to paint water classes. Um, and it's not this exact strategy, but we get the averages masked in and then we get the subtleties. So obviously this isn't a full painting here, but so we'll just kind of get the mass in just to teach you this. So I'm gonna go right here to my cast shadow coming on to the orange and I did red and blue, which is purple. So there's so many variations and this is a cast shadow. I noticed that it's darker and cooler than this one, okay? Okay. So there we go, we've got that in there. That's a cast shadow. So now, and I also noticed that it's more saturated. All right, so now I'm gonna go, I made another color while you guys were visiting or talking. Um, I noticed that this is cooler than the tabletop, all right? So red is a little bit cooler than yellow. So I did use white, yellow and red, but I used the red first, whereas on the table I used the yellow first. So I'm creating the relationships, all right? So now, since I got that masked in, I think if I will you're go just tuning in, our guest is Cami Mendlick, and she's uh, demonstrating a system that she's been teaching for almost 20 years, but has never revealed publicly. And the only reason she is is because she's uh, promoting her new book, Color Relativity, Creating the Illusion of Light with Paint, which we will have a comments, uh, we will have in the comments section. And this, of course, goes into a lot more depth uh, than the video today, but this is giving you kind of a basic lesson. Yeah, it's just a sample. And I, and I do this in plein air, too. Um, it's more of a strategy of what's going on in my head, but this is a way for people to practice this and comprehend it themselves. Okay, so I'm gonna use a different brush because I don't wanna clean that one. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna get into that. I'm gonna show you how I would make, oops, here we go. All right, so BY, blue, predominantly blue. And then this one's pretty saturated, so I, I don't think I'm gonna desaturate it with, yet, with white quite yet. I'm gonna see what this does. Oops, I might have gotten a little white in there. All right, so this just needs to be good and hot. I don't want it to be, yeah, I accidentally got some white in there, which is okay, I guess, but. All right, here we go. So that looks not that dark down here, but let me show you compared to white. All right. So this is the upright shadow. Gotta make a little bit more. The upright shadow is the shadow on an object that is not getting touched by the light. A cast shadow is a shadow that's casting from something. And it is important to know these things, to know what you're looking at. We get into form a lot in the book in the plane changes. So people, much to learn. There's so much to learn. Honestly, it's just, it's so exciting <laughs> because it's like, we're never gonna get there. And that's a good thing because why would we paint tomorrow, right? There's just so much to learn. And where is there anyway? I don't know. Right now, the process, exactly. the journey, right? The journey. It's all about the journey. It's all about the journey. It really is. I think that's why we love to paint is because it's never about the product. It's always about the process. But boy, does it feel good when the outcome is growing, you know, constantly growing. Yep. We well, we're growing. That. We're all growing from this today. 
Yeah, me too. Every single time this blows my mind, which I just love that. Every single time I do this, I get I get the goosebumps. Well, what I would have done, if you look at that string of shadows across the um, the bottom, uh, I would have just made all those shadows the same shadow. I would have not seen the, yeah. the variations in color in there. Yeah, it's really, um, gosh, you know, I don't know. I just get so excited because I just can't believe the endless, like, I remember hearing about it when I was younger, like I could hear a little bit from the masters, like we're never painting a literal interpretation, we're painting an illusion, but I just didn't quite get it. But I knew there was something, you know, I just, I knew to me, like shadows were not just gray, but you know, and for some people they are, but for me, they were not. I mean, I just like, I just, oh, I could see the purples and I could see all the colors. And so, you know, a lot of this, was just out of like complete desperation to have some kind of an approach. So I'm just painting as I'm talking, obviously here, but, but you know, every oh. time I go out and paint landscape, which I paint outside a lot. So if you don't know my work, this isn't what my work, if you saw this, you wouldn't know that this was by me. <laughs> well, we showed, so, we showed some of your work earlier yeah. and, uh, and we encourage everybody to get outside and paint. That's what we do. It's very, That's what we do very important thing. I'm just showing a little bit of your work right now so people can see that. And do you, when you're outside, uh, do you, are you going through the same kind of thought process when you're painting on location? Absolutely. That's, that's the thing. It's like, it might not look like what I'm painting like all the time, but sometimes I'll, I mean, I'll do it for my students just to prove it can be done. <laughs> you know, I'll show them this approach, but, but I definitely, oh, I'll show you what I'm doing down here. I, I always think like this. It's like not what the color is, but what it is compared to um, is what I'm always thinking about. So right now I'm actually getting the side of the bowl. All right. Now we're, we're going to run into a time crunch okay. here problem in a few minutes. So I think what okay. you do is get that side of the bowl in. And yeah. then if you could show us how you would kind of finesse one of the oranges or lemons or something when sure. adding the extra color. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of surprised I got this far, honestly. So I drive people hard. I'm so sorry. Oh, <laughs> it's all right. It's good. So basically, I would just mass this in. I mean, I guess I don't really need to. All right. So then we've got our mass, our averages in. I would get the backdrop. So, you know, finessing isn't really necessarily anything I would do, but I would, I would study the halftone. So the next thing is, let me just share this with people quick. Cast shadow, cast shadow, cast shadow, cast shadow. Upright, 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 upright. This is probably worth the price of admission right here for you admission. Half tone is the area that separates between light and dark and is the most form revealing element, okay? So the half tone is within the realm of light <clears throat> and you wanna, you wanna get that in first to start establishing the illusion of volume or form, 3D. Okay, so this is a 2D surface. We're painting a 3D object. So you can see this is round. So how do we make that look round? Well, the first element is to see the halftone, like we'll separate lights and darks. And then the halftone is right in here. And I just study it. Like, what is it to me? Then I start bringing in, you know, maybe the tertiaries. I see it's a little bit, <clears throat> well, <laughs> every color. I see kind of an orangish. Your hand is bit. kind of blocking. There we go. Can you see? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'll just start laying in. Whoops, I didn't get enough paint. The half tone. And that's going to be a little bit darker than your average light. And it's going to be held within the realm of light, which means it has to be lighter than your shadow. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's going to be a little bit different as you roll around, but that's the, that's how you start. You do not show a half tone on your cast shadows. You keep those hard. It's probably going to be easier just for me to show a painting that I've done since we don't have time. But like this is a cast shadow and see how it really looks like a cast shadow. That's because I don't show a half tone. It's got a harder edge. So where it's softer, that's where the half tones are. Okay, 
So this is a cast shadow, that's a cast shadow, cast shadow. If you can see, this is an upright, so we have a half tone. So the half tone kind of is like a transition color between light and dark. That's huge. You're yeah, right. That's, worth, that's, the price, that's, worth the price everybody paid to be here today. Yeah. <laughs> good deal. <laughs> so, I mean, I could keep painting if you want me to, but. Well, I think, why don't you come back on camera? That, yeah, that would be nice. That. All right. Terrific. <laughs> I'm crooked. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> I don't that's know what right. happened. That's okay. Well, this is fabulous, Cami. Uh, really, fun. really insightful. And I think if it, it's confusing, quite frankly, in the beginning. Yeah. Everybody needs to get your new book. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us just briefly about the book. Give us a little, like, 10 seconds on the book. Yeah, so the book is about 200 pages. Um, it's got 13 chapters. It goes from drawing to value to pri primary colors, secondary colors, tertiary colors, my strategy mixing. Um, it's got exercises and seeing color temperature. Uh, that's the landscape section you can see right there. And then it goes into the keys of light, warm light and cool light in the back showing my paintings. And then it ends with a gallery section of 25 pages of large studio paintings that have been in museums. Uh, so you can you can pre-order that book at colorrelativity.com. Yes colorrelativity.com. And, and uh, when is the book actually coming out? By the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. Oh, exciting. Very exciting. It's been 10 years. Yeah. It's been a, a lot of work. I had an, I have an editor, I have a designer. Um, it's a beautiful quality. And um, yeah, it's, it's, I've put my, my heart and soul into it. Well, it shows and congratulations. I think it's very exciting. And what you taught today was so valuable and, uh, and maybe we'll figure out how to, to capture that whole that whole thing on video at some point. The whole yeah, book. we should do that. That would be It'd fun. Be well, Cami, thank you so you much. Everybody can visit uh, Cami's website, uh, uh, which is in the comments section. Also, we have put the link to the book in the comments section. Everybody uh, share this because this is good stuff and everybody needs to see it. Uh, thank yeah, I you. think people could watch this over and over and really, you know, take notes. It, you've got to process it a little bit, but yeah, I'm going to watch it uh, over and over again. And I'm going to try it tonight when I get into the studio. I, I will interrupt the painting I'm working okay. on and and just lay this out. I think the best thing to do with these lessons is to just try the lesson that day if you have that mm -hmm. chance because it'll help cement it in your brain. Yeah, can I just say one more thing? Nope. I think what's the most important thing to realize. No, you, you and, can't say one more thing. Yeah. I have a lot of things to say. I could talk <laughs> all day, but, no, go but ahead. I just really, because I know how this works, I know that this works and it can change anyone's work for the better is just realize that this isn't how to paint. This is how to see the relationships of color to create light. It can strengthen anyone's work. I promise. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much, Cammie. Yeah, thank you. This has been All fun. Right. Have you ever wondered how some artists get such realistic quality in their work? You know, unbelievably beautiful portraits, stunning figures, and realistic looking still lifes or florals? Painting or drawing realism takes your work to a whole new level. Whether you want tight, carefully rendered realistic paintings or looser, more impressionistic realism, most high-level artists will tell you that painting is a skill that anyone can learn. If you follow a process, you can paint beautiful, realistic artwork. But where do you learn? You could spend 3000 or more to attend a live workshop or convention, or you can learn from the world's finest realist from home for a fraction of the cost. At Realism Live, the world's first virtual online realism conference, you'll get three days of world-class artists demonstrating their techniques and processes. This is a comprehensive conference covering all the subjects you want to learn in portraiture, figures, landscapes, still life, cityscapes, color mixing, and more. Taught by the world's leading artists. Not only will you learn their techniques, you'll have a chance to interact with instructors and get your questions answered. And you'll get to know other artists personally through our breakout sessions. And we'll even paint and draw together at the end of each day. 
Make new friends in our breakout sessions. Paint with hundreds of others. Get private access to our exclusive members group to become a part of our community and learn to take your artwork to a higher level. Realism Live is three full days of painting and drawing instruction, November 10th through 12th. And for people who want to learn painting and drawing from scratch, start with our Beginner's Day One Day Atelier on November 9th. Soon you'll be painting faces, people, flowers, scenery, objects, and other subjects. You'll see your artwork improve faster as you learn from top artists and instructors from all over the world. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together from these amazing artists. Glenn Vilpu, John Potoshenek, Alex Kelly, Ned Mueller, Terry Strickland, Dustin Van Welchel, Lisa Egwe, Clyde Aspavig, Sarah Sedwick, Rose Franson, Chuck Morris, Michelle Dunaway, Michael Mittler, Daniel Graves, Leona Shanks, Alexander Shanks, Juliet Aristides, Carol Peebles, Tony Pro, Todd M. Casey, Cornelia Hernes, Sandra Angelo, Oliver Sin, Sharon Sprung, Mario Robinson, Deborah Hughes, and many more to be announced. And it's hosted by fine art connoisseur and publisher Eric Rhodes and editor-in-chief Peter Trippi. And if you can't watch live, you can watch replays on your own time for up to a year. And it's 100% guaranteed. You'll be pleasantly surprised to realize just how much you can learn in such a short time. Realism Live, from the publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. Sign up today to reserve your seat now 